Okay, so, uh, uh, Philippe, uh, very great thank you for this invitation. I'm really honored to be there and to, to start this meeting, and also it's a really a wonderful occasion to meet again all those old friends. Um, I was a bit, uh, I wondered at the beginning when you, from the title of the colloquium, whether I should dig in my old PhD slides for some mouse experiments, and then I thought it would be uh, too much work, so uh, I stick to what I'm doing now, that is working on zebrafish. And uh, my current work is mostly on viral infections, and one of the problems we have with uh, viral viruses is that uh, they are difficult to detect more than other pathogens. Uh, it's not easy to find what are the target organ, what uh, very often there are reservoirs which we don't know, and the way that viruses uh, disseminate within a body and the way our body fights this virus are very difficult to understand. Uh, this is in complex tissues. Tissue culture uh, gives only very partial information there. And that's a place where really we need some animal models. And of course, as you know, we have a choice of animal models. And each time there are models and there are trade-offs, which are typically some are more relevant to the human situation. But uh, this comes to the cost of uh, less animals, much more difficult to, uh, to use, uh, more costly, eth ethical issues, and so on. So you have this whole range uh, of possibilities. And I would like to convince you that there is, there, among those classical organisms, so mouse are king somehow, but that there is a middle way, which is, of course, the zebrafish. And actually, it's not the adult zebrafish, as you see there, the one that I'm going to uh, show you is done only with a larval zebrafish, which has uh, specific advantages, as you will see. So, why would one choose a zebrafish larva? The key point with a zebrafish is that it's excellent for imaging. Uh, you probably already have seen this classical movie of the first 20 hours of the development of a zebrafish embryo. Uh, this is relatively easy to take because uh, fertilization is external, and so you can see all the events. You see gastrulation there, and you see the formation of the, of, uh, the head, the somites, and so on. So you have, in uh, two days, basically, uh, an almost independent organism that is formed. And this is the reason why the zebrafish has become a classical model for development bio biology, and which has uh, helped. Many tools have been generated for, uh, for this purpose. It's much more recently that it has been also uh, been co-opted uh, to study uh, host pathogen interactions. But there again, imaging can show uh, quickly its power. So in this movie, actually, uh, Emma colussi guillon in the lab has injected non-pathogenic bacteria on the flank of a young zebrafish larva, a three-day larva, right between the epidermis and the muscle mass. And this is a transgenic line where you have the neutrophils, which express GFP. And she just put that under a classical standard confocal microscope and imaged that. So this is for five hours. And now you can see uh, how the cells come fast and are going to uh, uh, phagocytose and eliminate uh, those bacteria. There are also some macrophages there, which are not labeled, but you can see uh, also the phagosomes, which are full of bacteria. And as you understand, uh, this is an excellent model to, to, to directly uh, detect host pathogen interactions. So there are also important genetic assets working with zebrafish, one being that we can have a lot of eggs. So this is 100 uh, zebrafish embryos in a typical petri dish, which is a standard output of one single female, which you can have every five days. Uh, so you have a lot of animals to do what you want. Uh, the genome is now fully sequenced with a relatively good quality uh, um, assembly. And also, we have uh, tools to perform uh, genetic manipulation of the animals, uh, which is gene knockdown or gene overexpression at the first stages, at the larval stages, by using a uh, microinjection. As you see in this movie, we are there uh, microinjecting a morpholino, which is a nice antisens oligonucleotide that is going to block translation or splicing of a gene of interest. And so you can very easily uh, reduce the expression of uh, your chosen gene. And that's relatively easy to perform. And also, we have now a large uh, amount, a uh, large array of uh, mutant fish, like those um, pigmentless fish, as you can see here, 
and transgenics, like this one, which we, we label the endothelial cells. And this is growing also very fast. There is now a program to have a mutant in every gene of the zebrafish genome. Um, where the zebrafish is less advanced is uh, for the models for uh, infections. Uh, this has been uh, more or less tackled only in the last 10 years. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can have a look at this review by uh, Michel Canter and John Rawls in current opinion in immunology showing, uh, so there are a lot of bacteria that have been used successfully to infect zebrafish, a few viruses, and also it's relatively easy to get germ-free animals and to uh, colonize with a given uh, intestinal macroflora. And well, I've just listed two uh, important discoveries that uh, the zebrafish helps to make like the fact that uh, hydrogen peroxide is a major climatractant for phagocytes when you have a sterile wound, or the fact that uh, macrobacteria uh, can use granuloma to, to disseminate uh, in the nice model with macrobacterium marinum, which is a natural um, pathogen of zebrafish, and uh, which has been studied by Lalita Ramakrishnan in great detail. So just a short uh, introduction to the zebrafish immune system. So zebrafish are vertebrates, so they have an immune system which is fairly similar to ours. Of course, they have adaptive immunity, uh, but uh, as in us, it's relatively, uh, it takes weeks to, to, to be functional. So you would have, in fact, T and B cells only at the juvenile and adult stage. Uh, and so you have a thymus. Uh, there is no bone marrow, but you have a hematopoietic site in the adult or the kidney, and it's in the tail uh, of, the, um, of the larva. And also you have the hematopoietic cells coming from the uh, AGM, aorta gonadomesonephros, as in mice, as uh, Anna would show you uh, certainly. Uh, and there are a lot of cell types and a lot of genes which are very similar to, the, to what you find uh, in, uh, in mammals. Uh, I just like to emphasize that I'm going to show you experiments done with animals which are aged from three to six days post fertilization, basically. And this is a stage where the animals have already hatched, so they are naturally exposed to the uh, environment, so they have to be able to, uh, to have efficient defenses. Uh, but they only have an, the innate arm of the immune system, because the uh, uh, adaptative is not mature yet, but it's a vertebrate-like innate immunity. And they have at this stage macrophages and neutrophils, which are well-characterized and functional. And they have also those uh, molecules which we know. So for us, working on viruses, it was very important to uh, characterize the interference system. And uh, this slide uh, basically uh, sums up five years of, uh, of work, uh, where we had to uh, identify uh, the zebrafish uh, viral-induced interference and their receptors. Um, and so uh, we now we know that zebrafish, they have type 1 interference. Uh, they also have gamma interference, but this is, uh, I'm speaking only of the really virus-induced uh, innate interference. Um, they don't uh, have an equivalent of interferon lambda so far. We thought at the beginning that those genes could be interferon lambda-like, because they have uh, several exons, but in fact, now we know the structure, we have established the crystal structure, and they are really like type 1 interferons, and their function is equivalent. But you still have a kind of diversification with two different receptors and two different groups, which may be uh, uh, somehow similar functionally to this discrepancy you have in, uh, in mammals, but we are working on that, we don't know yet. What we know also is that the uh, induction uh, pathways using the rig eye like receptors and KLR receptors and uh, all the uh, intermediate molecules in the, um, in the cascade are very well conserved. And actually also the interferon stimulated genes, so you have also a list of uh, hundreds of genes which are induced by the interference, where you have many uh, genes which are very similar to that in mammals and uh, clearly have uh, similar functions. So now working, uh, let's go to the uh, viruses and I will, discuss, I will show about two different viruses that we are working with. The first one uh, is a fish virus, which is uh, um, uh, infectious hematopoietic necrosis virus. Well, it's a rhabdovirus and it originally comes from salmon. It has been identified in uh, aquaculture facilities in the United States and now it has spread worldwide. 
Um, and uh, this is uh, very infectious to salmons. Uh, and otherwise, this is a classical, somewhat classical uh, rhabdovirus with bullet shaped. There is this NV gene, which is a bit specific uh, and has a function which is not very well known. Um, the point is that uh, we needed, uh, at first, we, we have no zebrafish natural virus so far. So, uh, with Pierre Boudinot in, in RA, we have been trying a lot of different uh, fish viruses to find one that would be convenient to work with. And this one, as you will see, is very, uh, gives very reproducible and practical results. Uh, but the problem is that, as salmon is a, a cold water species, we had to use a variant which is adapted to, uh, to higher temperatures because the is a tropical fish. And this, in fact, has been generated by Pierre de Quinclin uh, 20 years ago, trying to make a vaccine strain, simply by uh, taking uh, one of those viruses and making repeated uh, culture, culturing a uh, fish cell, EPC, and slightly, slowly increasing the temperature until he could get a strain that is adapted to 25 degrees. And so we have this strain, which can grow and kill the cells at 25 degrees, but at 28, while the wild type would not grow at 24. That's very convenient for us because both 24 and 28 are very good temperature for the zebrafish in its natural range. So we can, at, uh, at will, block replication of the virus simply by shifting the temperature. So uh, this virus gives very reproducible clinical signs. So we micro-inject uh, the virus in the, uh, in the vein, in the blood of the, of the fish. And what you see is that in basically three, three to, four, to four days, the fish will die, all of them. Uh, and with a series of uh, signs, which first you will see the blood flow that will slow down in the tail while the heart is still beating. And then uh, the fish will still move at this time, but after some time, if you wait for a few hours more, you will not react anymore if you touch it. And then you will have uh, the complete arrest. So we have, can have clinical scores to have detailed analysis of what happened. If you look in more detail as a, at, uh, at the fish using higher magnification, you can see that they will have hemorrhages. And you have two examples there in, the, uh, in this vessel that is around the eye, or there in, uh, in the pericardial cavity, and well, a few other uh, typical, uh, typical signs like edemas and so on. So we looked at progression of the whole body, first doing classical uh, analysis, like you take fish, you, uh, you dissociate it, and you take the supernatant and make a black assay, and you see that uh, you have more and more virus over time, as time goes, which you can find also by a quantitative uh, RT-PCR. But of course, what is interesting with zebrafish is to look at where you have the virus. And for that, there is a method, which is a classical method uh, for the model biologist, which is whole mount in situ hybridization, where you would use, just use a probe complementary to one of the genes of the virus. And in this case, as the expression level in the infected cell is very high, this is very sensitive and it goes very fast. So that's very simple. So you, we can detect the infected cells as soon as six hours after the inoculation of the virus. And you see that progressively it grows um, and it spreads to more tissues, but you have a typical, uh, typical pattern like the gills, which are very heavily infected and so on. So you see it's not random. If you look in more detail, you will find that the early times, you will find the virus where you have the, ma the major vessels of the fish. And if you look a bit longer, you will see that this seems to have spread to other cells next to the vessels. So really had the impression that the endothelial were the first cells to be infected. And to look at that, we use this FLY1 GFP transiting zebrafish, where all the uh, endothelial cells are labeled with GFP. And clearly, you see that in infected fish, there is a problem with endothelium. Uh, it's disrupted. Uh, it's difficult to say at this stage whether the cells are killed or they ju just lose GFP, but at least something uh, happens. So to understand what was going on, we uh, had a look in higher detail using uh, immunohistochemistry with uh, antibodies against uh, viral proteins, like the P protein there. And so uh, and this is, again, GFP to label the vessels. And so we could see that we would have holes in the vessels uh, where you would have uh, infected cells. But usually it was difficult to have colocalization. 
Uh, and the reason, we think, is that uh, the cells, when they are infected, they are going to lose very fast the GHP expression. But if you look at the right moment, you can still find co-localization, as in this cell, typically. So this is looking in the brain, in one of the major vessels of the head, where you have this endothelial cell, which very clearly co-expresses GFP and the viral protein. So uh, we have now definitive evidence that the endothelial cells are the first targets of the virus. As I told you, we can uh, play with the temperature to uh, block the replication of the virus. And uh, so if you infect the fish and then put them at 28 degrees, they won't develop any disease sign. If you wait for uh, 24 hours, what you find that at 24 hours, they have absolutely no detectable uh, sign of disease. But still, but so if you put them at 28, the virus is not able to, to grow anymore, but still the fish is going to die more slowly, but he's going to die anyway with some different signs with big edemas and so on, showing that there was a point of no return with too much damage to the endothelium likely, and it's not able to recover from that. We looked at different time points to see what was a critical time, and so it's about 15 to 18 hours where you would have irreversible damage. And so at this stage, the infection is too advanced for the fish to recover. And what is interesting there is that if you look at the uh, induction of the host response, like so expression of interferon uh, or of interferon stimulated genes in the fish, you can detect it, but much later. Uh, not before 24 hours, and usually it's about two days. So, but the, so this point of no return is there. So clearly, this response is delayed and the fish is not able to uh, recover, and that's why all, the, all those fish actually die from the infection. So, to make a short summary of this part, we have with this system uh, a model where we have a lethal infection, which is highly predictable, which is kind of, well, it's a hemorrhagic disease, okay, like a parohemorrhagic fever, if you want, and where we have a delayed and inefficient host response, and we also have tools for performing live imaging of the uh, infected cells, which I don't have time to show you. So this has been published last year, and what I'm going to share with you is a second virus, which is still unpublished data, and regarding uh, chikungunya. Uh, so I'm not going to go into much detail about chikungunya because there will be other speakers much more proficient than me for that. Just to say that this is a mosquito-transmitted uh, virus, which is a pathogen for humans. Uh, and it's uh, now a re-emerging uh, threat, uh, mostly because it has now adapted to a new host, uh, to a new mosquito, the tiger mosquito, with a large distribution range, larger than the previous uh, Aedes aegypti, and so now, th that's why there was this big outbreak in La Réunion Island in 2005, and now we also have some uh, cases uh, in Europe, um, and uh, in Italy and in France. Uh, this is not a very dangerous disease. It's painful, but it doesn't last for very long. Uh, you have especially uh, pain in the muscle and uh, the joints. What is a bit strange is that people recover, but then they can have recurring bouts of pain, the cause of which is not really clearly established. So the virus is, again, a RNA virus, but of a different family than the previous one. What was interesting for us was that uh, as mosquito is also a natural host, it uh, grows at 28 degrees naturally, so that's fine uh, to work in zebrafish. And also there was a GFP recombinant which was available, so it was very simple to, to make initial tests. So uh, we started a collaboration with Olivier Schwartz uh, in Institut Pasteur, testing uh, this virus uh, in zebrafish. So we injected uh, chikungunya virus in zebrafish larvae, and what happened was a transient illness in this case. Uh, so there are some clear signs. So this is a control fish, and you would see that the yolk looks strange, it's opaque. And so this is a swim bladder, which will not inflate or which inflate later, but not much from a part of that. And actually, so as this is done with the GFP virus, you can see that this correlates with strong infection in the yolk, it's a stasis cell cell. And also you have a lot of cells there in the head that you can see. When we looked at the title of the virus, we could see that uh, we had very strong replication at the beginning, until 24 hours, and then it plateaued and even tended to decrease for some time. 
And we had a minority of fish where we'd have some signs, but there were typically 10%. All the other fish would recover and be fine. So to look at the tropism of the virus, we first used, uh, so we had the GFP, and we also used as a control an anti-capsid antibody in case GFP expression would, GFP would mutate and would be lost. And uh, for instance, if you took, take a fish uh, only 24 hours after the infection, you would see strong expression of the capsids in many cells in the jaw, in some cells in the liver, and some cells in the yolk. We looked at that in much more detail using confocal microscopy, and so we could see uh, fibroblasts in, infected, like those ones in the, um, in the fin, a few muscle fibers, not many, but a few ones, uh, endothelial cells, uh, like you see between the somites there, with a typical morphology. Uh, we, in the, so we had those big cells in the liver, which uh, could show were hepatocytes using a transgenic line uh, labeling with those cell types. And also, if you look a bit, little bit later, you will see that you have neurons. Well, you have infection in the brain, and we could show using a neuron-specific line that at least some neurons were infected by the virus. Actually, you can see that the tropism is shifting over time. So this is the same fish image every day. And so at the beginning, you have the liver, which is infected, and the yolk and a few cells there. And you would see that the ex expression of the GFP in the yolk will disappear, as well as in the liver. But you would have some expression that will remain in the brain, as detected there using immunohistochemistry. And this has been quantified painfully by Nuno Palia, my PhD student. And uh, you on many fish, uh, quantifying how many cells in different tissues. And basically, what you can see is that in most tissues, you have a transient, you have a wave of infection, like there in the liver, in the muscle, or in the, the jaw, and so on, the gills. Except in the brain, where you would have more and more fish having infection, and this infection lasting for much longer. We could show that this was due to the death, uh, to the violent death of those cells, uh, using time-lapse imaging. So in this case, uh, this is a fish uh, that has been infected uh, eight hours before we started the imaging. I will ask you, so we, you will see a lot of cells appearing uh, with GFP, as we'll have the time-lapse. This is the liver, and where you have the brightest cells, and we'll ask you to look at this cell here. This one, so you see, and there you have some neighbors, and there you see the cells are dying with apoptosis-like signs and blebbing and so on. And so we are, we are now quantifying at one time those cells are dying, and this correlates well with, uh, with the tropisms that we've seen. Looking at that in more detail, uh, we, uh, well, I'm convinced that this is uh, cell autonomous in, in a sense, and not killing by other cells. So in this movie, uh, so that was done on the tail, as you, can, as you can see, there were two infected cells there, and you will see a lot of cells that will be uh, uh, non-labeled, that will uh, migrate along, which are leukocytes, macrophages, and, and neutrophils. Okay, you can see them. And then you see this cell dies, and this cell dies. And at the moment this cell has dying, was dying, there was a cell that was passing by. So at one moment I thought that perhaps those leukocytes would kill infected cells. But in fact, if you look in more detail, so first this is just a GFP to show that you have blebbing, then rounding and disappearance, so typical apoptosis-like signs. And if you look now uh, more slowly, you will see the phagocyte that is going to appear there. It came and it ate the cell, but the cell actually became round much before. So it was just eliminating an apoptotic cell, like any macrophage would do, but not killing the cells that were dying before. Well, uh, an interesting feature of this infection uh, is that we have a very strong induction of uh, the endogenous interferon response. So that was just our first quantifications uh, of this response. And this is compared between chikungunya and the IHNV virus that I showed you before. So as you can see, it's much earlier and it's much, much stronger. And it's true as well for the interferon or for one of the typical ISGs. And uh, looking at this uh, in, more with a, in, in more detail at more time points, we see it's very early and it lasts for very long. And it correlates very well with the viral titers, in fact. This is important for the fish to survive because actually if you knock down the expression of the interferon receptor using morpholino, and then, you, so you have the equivalent of an if-now knockout fish if you want, 
and then you challenge them with the chikungunya virus, you would see that those fish, actually they are going to die, almost all of them, and which much uh, higher titers, about 10 to, uh, to 30 fold higher than in the normal fish. So this interferon response is really important for the fish to survive. And I don't have much time to, to get into this, unfortunately, but we are looking at that in much more detail using now a transgenic line that we have developed, which is a reporter for interferon V1 expression using m -Sherry. And so we can see that, in fact, in this fish, we have two populations of cells that express interferon. There was a surprise, liver cells express high level of interferon, and also a population of leukocytes. So when we designed this uh, transgenic line, we thought, well, we were hoping to find the equivalent of plasma dendritic cells, the cells that make the whole level, uh, high level of interferon in mammals. And to our surprise, in fact, it turned out that most of these cells appear to be neutrophils, which is really uh, surprising. And so we are now uh, making depletion, specific depletion of those different cell types to understand the function of those two different uh, cell populations in the defense of the fish. So to conclude from this part, uh, this chikungunya uh, infection in zebrafish, you obtain a transient disease, which in fact is similar to what you, to you have with the mammalian models, with a very potent and protective endogenous interferon response. And it's not uh, random if you need, if not knockout mice to, to have a good titers. Uh, there is a very interesting observations regarding this shift in tropism and with this longer persistence is in the central nervous system, which is, well, it's not uh, unique to chikungunya. Of course, many viruses have this property, but this is, I think, a very good model to understand why uh, a virus would persist in the, uh, in the central nervous system. And we have uh, all the tools to make live imaging of both infection of the host response at the same time. And so this is a model which is highly complementary to the IHNV model. So uh, I hope I have convinced you that the zebrafish is a important, interesting new model to study host virus interactions and that it will be possible to address many interesting questions uh, like uh, accelerating the study of uh, the role of the interference uh, induced genes, understand the strategies of viral dissemination, uh, why they would prefer to persist in some tissues over others, uh, understand so these interference producing cells, the evolution of the plasma cytric dendritic cell, for instance, and uh, last but not least, one has to remember that zebrafish being small, it's very easy to conduct drug screens. Uh, you have there an embryo in a 96-fold plate. Uh, and so uh, to uh, look for antiviral drugs is also a nice model. Uh, I would just like to finish uh, regarding this, which is a classical paradigm of how people see viral infection in tissues. That is, at the beginning, you have the tissue, which is unprotected, and you have those leukocytes which are there to protect it. The virus comes, infects a few cells, and will be detected also by uh, those cells, so like the plasma cytoidentic cells, which will start to make interferon. As they make interferon, they signal to those cells here, the other ones, which will start to express interferon-stimulated genes, and therefore uh, being, become refractory to the infection. And so this cell will die, but uh, first it, the, some new virus will have infected the other, these other cells. And then at the end, you have the tissue which expresses interferon stimulated genes and the interferon uh, produced by the plasma cytoidentic cells. A few cells are dead, and the tissue is now protected. Uh, our observations with zebrafish and some data which I didn't show you show that, uh, well, this is globally right, but it has to be modulated because tissues tend to respond very differently from each other. And in fact, you uh, have this simplified model where you have three different types of tissues. This one which corresponds to the central nervous system, this one to the fibroblasts, and this one to the liver. The liver is in fact able to resist by itself. It pre-expresses some interferon-stimulated genes, although it's very susceptible to infection. But at the end, it will be one of the major source of the, of the interferon. The fibroblasts can be infected, but there they will respond, uh, they will, cells will die, and then they will express and resist. While the uh, cell, or you have those cells like the central nervous system where the virus will be able to uh, persist for a much longer time, and we don't know why it's not cytopathic in those cells, 
Uh, and also we think that those cells are much slower to uh, express um, interference stimulated genes. And so uh, that would be really interesting to uh, understand why. So to conclude, I would like to uh, acknowledge the people that have contributed to this work. So this work has been done at the Institut Pasteur in the unit of uh, Philippe Arbomel. And this has been done mostly by Nuno Palia, a very talented PhD student from Portugal. And with your help, so uh, the HNV work has been tar started by uh, M2 student, Mario Ludwig, and also with the help of uh, Valérie, Maxence, and Emma. Uh, we had a collaboration with Olivier Schwartz uh, for the chikungunya. A uh, very long-standing collaboration with Pierre Boudinot for all the fish viruses and all aspects of the interference response at INRA, Jouan Josas. Uh, also a long-standing collaboration with Georges Outra in Montpellier about uh, interference and receptors, and also with um, a structural biologists in uh, Denmark uh, with whom we made this, the interference structures. And, of course, I would like to acknowledge Philippe, because all this well, not the zebrafish, but my own personal adventure started exactly 20 years ago in his lab. Thank you.